All right. Okay, everybody, you know, I've had the opportunity uh, to speak to some incredible leaders in business and the entertainment industry, and today is no exception. My guest today is one of the highest ranking and longest serving black executives on Wall Street. Ray McGuire was vice chairman of City and chairman of the Banking Capital Markets and Advisory Group. Prior to that, he had a 13 year tenure as City's global head of corporate and investment banking. He has personally originated and executed deals valued at over $650 billion. He recently made news when he decided to step down from his very coveted position and toss his hat into the ring for mayor of New York. Please, everybody, welcome Ray McGuire. See, Ray. Hi, Ray. Hello, Sean. Hello, Sean. How are you? How, how are you doing, my friend? I am well, thank you. I'm actually doing great. Friday night, doing well. Friday night, good. And, and how is the weather there in New York? You know, it's a little cold. We had a big snowstorm, so the snowstorm yes. is kind of tapered off. We're expecting some more weather this weekend. But listen, New York is, New York is, we're doing okay here. Okay. okay, well, that's good. That's good. Here in LA, it's 61, and they're still complaining that it's too cold. So <laughs> it's a little bit, yeah, it's a little bit different. So, um, uh, okay, so full disclosure to the audience Ray is a good friend of mine, okay? Um, he is actually married to one of my best friends, uh, my Detroit homegirl, Crystal McCrary. Uh, and because of that, uh, Ray has always, for me, been like just Ray, you know, I, you know, been at the house and I'm sitting around talking to Crystal. I'm like, no, what does Ray do again? And so, <laughs> and so she like, oh, well, you know, he's just like writes some checks or whatever. So this is going to be fun for me, Ray, to take a journey through your career and learn more about you and how you reached uh, such great heights. Um, I want to talk about, uh, obviously, you know, where you come from, your background, uh, lessons for success that you mm -hmm. can share with our audience. I want to talk about your philanthropy. Obviously, that's very important for me. And why, at this point uh, in your career, you want to jump into politics. So uh, we got a lot to cover, my friend, and uh, a short amount of time to do so, because I know you have to get back uh, to the kids and everything. So uh, we'll, I'll try to, my best to keep us on track. Okay, you ready? I'm ready, Sean. I am ready. Thank you, right. by the way. Thank you for having me. I have for so long not only admired the friendship that, you, uh, that you've had for so long with my better three quarters wife, Crystal, but I've so admired and respected you as one of the preeminent journalists in the country, as a matter of fact, on the globe. So it is out of respect and admiration that I'm honored to be here. So thank you. Let's get this done here. Okay, thank you so much, Ray. Thank you. Okay, let's first talk about your childhood. Dayton, Ohio, Midwest. How far back do you remember? Oh, I go back. That's my home. That's my foundation. So I always remember my foundation. That is and always will be home. That's where I grew up. That's where my mother raised me and my two brothers. So that's that's it. I start at the bottom, but that's the foundation. So it's as strong as it gets. Yes. How far back into your childhood do you actually remember? Do you remember yourself, yourself as a kid there, like what you would do, like playing? What was it like? Yeah, you know, growing up in Dayton, you kind of grew up, you know, in the on the front porch. I remember the front porch. I remember the back porch. I remember the alleyway where we played basketball and where we played as much of baseball as we could. I remember yeah. you used to take those old baskets, those old, I guess they were clothes baskets. You have to cut the clothes baskets out in order to make a basket. You had to nail them up to the, <laughs> yeah. metal, to the tree. So I remember that. I, you know, I remember that fondly. I remember going fishing with my uncle James. Uh -huh. Dough balls. You don't know anything about that. Y'all don't know anything. Dough balls. That. What are dough balls? Dough balls. You put a little something, something, and the fish would hit the reel. Oh. And that's where you'd go in. That's where you go and fish. Make something. You came home with something. So I remember that. I remember. You know, I remember, uh, you know, walking across the trestle, which is a huge, strange track bridge. 
across the train track bridge across the water with my grandfather and my two brothers. I remember my brothers getting in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> You you remember when they got in trouble, but now yeah, I remember my brothers got yeah. My oldest brother's Arthur, my middle brother's Tony. I remember they got in trouble. Yeah, them boys. <laughs> you uh, you were raised by a single mom, and yeah. Your, yes. yeah. Tell me about your mother. My mother, uh, you know, prayers being what they are. If Lord delays is coming, and on the twenty sixth, no, two twenty one, on the twenty first of this month, my mother will be ninety five. Oh, wow. Um, so her. my mother is a, she's a prayer warrior. She's a praying woman. Prayer's got us here. So yeah, yeah my mother, my 95, soon to be 95 year old mother is what got me here through her sacrifice. And my mother was a social worker. Mm -hmm. So my mother raised me and my two brothers along with my grandparents. And she is, she is the foundation. She's the rock. And that woman is, that woman is, that's, that's, that woman's a yeah. saint. That woman's what, a Was she strict? Was she strict on you growing up? Well, I don't necessarily call it strict, but as my mama used to say, I can show you better than I can tell you. So you kind of figure out what you want to do here, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I I knew I I'm very clear on what a switch is. Yeah. I know what a belt looks like. I know what a fastball with a shoe looks like. <laughs> so yeah, I you know, I I I I know what it's all about. You remember that. You remember that. You say that, as I was researching, you say that I never knew my father. He never acknowledged me. Mm -hmm. What impact did that have on you, having that absence of a father? You know, you just never miss what you never had. So it didn't have an impact on me. I think people talk about it in ways that it should have had, but it didn't, in large part because my mother was such a strong, dynamic woman who worked every day for us and, and made certain that we had. And my grandparents were there, you know, my grandmother and my grandfather. And we grew up in the church. But, you know, I guess, as I said, you don't miss what you never had. So I didn't miss it. And my mother was there. And so she played whatever role that was necessary to play in my life and my brother's life. So, you know, yeah. I think we did OK. That foundation was solid. That The foundation is you know, when the foundation is as solid as she planted, the trees was the the root was so strong, mm -hmm. root strong. So yes. that 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 woman that woman made me what I am today. Yes. Let's talk about school. Did school come easy to you? Well, you know, I can't tell it came easy. I can tell you this is what I remember vividly in the fifth grade. I was in the auditorium at the end of the school year. Yeah. And I kept getting called up to the stage to collect some kind of award. I had no idea what this was all about. And there was a teacher there, Ellen Moore, who said, you know, I think he's got something. So she called my mother and mm -hmm. said, you know, they're building their school. They built their school out in the south of town. And, you know, I live in the neighborhood on the other way on the other side of the tracks. And I think he ought to apply to that school. And she said, well, you know, we'll apply, but I ain't got no money. We can't afford a school like that. And I applied and we got in and I got a scholarship and I was at that school and I had to walk, I don't know, three quarters of a mile to a mile to get to a corner. Whoa. Uh huh. I got to that corner and I waited for the bus. And the bus came from north of town to south of town and it picked me up on that corner. I'd walk to that corner and wait there every day for that bus wow. to pick me up. And I did that from sixth grade until probably the 10th grade, 11th grade, 11th grade. In mm -hmm. 11th grade, Sean, I had a I had a 4.0 average. I was president of the, of the school, and I averaged 28 points per game playing basketball. And there was another teacher who said, you know, if you're as good as they say you are, why don't you go test yourself against the big boys and girls in the East? I said, okay, where well, are they? Well, let, let me ask you about that, Ray, because you did have this 4.0, plus mm -hmm. you were a star on the basketball court. Now, I'm wondering, at any point, did anyone try to steer you towards athletics? Sure, sure. That, yeah. You know, athletics has always been one of the primary ways out. Yeah. And I played, I, you know, I, I had enough game here to go and I played in high school and went on to play a little bit in college, but that wasn't the route for me. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, and, and, you know, you have, when you get a good foundation education, the world opens up. And so yes, you, you find that that's not your only route, that the yeah. athletics is not your only route. So, okay, your, your teacher said, play with the big boys and girls in the East. What did that mean? 
if you if you're as good as they say, I go compete against them. Yeah. I said, okay, where are they? And so, Sean, I took a plane by myself to Bradley Field, which is now Bradley International Airport. And I took a Greyhound bus around New England by myself, 16 years old. Greyhound bus, looking for school, looking for the big boys and girls in the East. And I landed at a school in Lakeville, Connecticut called the Hotchkiss School. A prep school. What was that experience like? I got to tell you, that was a other, that was a whole nother world. You know, I got there and I saw these kids with these little shirts, those little shirts with the alligators on them. <laughs> right. I didn't know what that was, right? And I had a three piece suit. I was I was clean. I had a three piece suit. I had a big fro and had on earth shoes. And that was my <laughs> and that three piece suit was a brown jacket, a brown pair, and mismatched pants, houndstooth check pants. And polyester was a way to go. And I know that shirt, that little short sleeve shirt those kids had on cost more than my entire wardrobe. But that's OK. Yeah. I, my stuff was tight. <laughs> so so prep school, like, it, you know, that that was a different experience for you. What 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 did it cultivate in you? What did you learn there? How did it set you help your path uh, towards where you are today? You know, just open up my world that much more. And mm -hmm. what you, the good thing about it is I didn't know that I should have been impressed, right? Because mm -hmm. I was just there for an education. That was a primary and, and you know, kind yes. of thrown everything. I'd risk everything. Now that I look back because it was my 12th grade year. And I did all this up to 11th grade and 12th grade year. I said, okay, let's go test myself against these folks out East. Uh, yes. And so that was it. And so what I learned, what I, it just, another world expanded. Mm -hmm. Language. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit, but the language has expanded and yeah. how I thought about culture and art, all that expanded. And the other thing that that was very real is that it had so few of us who were black there mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. world that has been, you know, had for long not been open to us. And so that was even though the school that I went to in Dayton was primarily uh, white. This school was really, I mean, this is kind of the heart of the, the yes. East Coast establishment. So it was another world, but that's okay. I was there for to get an education. That's what it that was is, all about. It's interesting that you said you didn't know you were supposed to be impressed. You went to Harvard undergrad. Was mm -hmm. that a welcoming experience for you when you got there? You know, given the Hotchkiss experience, yes, it was welcoming. But I got to tell you, I still was sport my double nets. <laughs> That was it. I didn't know anything about a natural fiber. And that was one of the things that distinguished me, right? I'm running around with my beige double knit bell bottoms. I'd gotten a few, you know, few garments, but polyester was it. So. Yeah. So tell me about Harvard. Here you are. Not many faces look like yours. What was that experience like for you? That, you know, that world opened up even more. I can remember my freshman year. I was the first one into the room. And then mm -hmm. the second person in the room was a person I'd met on tour of those schools. Second person was a guy named Willie Lawrence from Cleveland, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Cleveland had gone to Exeter and done quite well at Exeter. And he moved in and there was Willie Lawrence, me and Willie Lawrence. And then there are two other guys who had also been at prep, prep school, uh, Claude Sloan and Dorian Nunez. Mm -hmm. They'd gone to a school called St. Paul. And they randomly put four black boys in a room together, freshman wow. year. And so, you know, that brought a whole bunch of whole bunch of things with it. All of which were, all of which were great. I mean, this is a wonderful experience. It's a great experience. You remember the names and everything. So oh, yeah. uh, I don't remember that. I remember exactly where we lived, Wigglesworth C fifty one, right behind the library. Oh yes. I remember <laughs> that. Uh, you were the first in your family to graduate from college. Mm -hmm. What was that day like for you and for your mom? You know, that had to be one of the proudest days that we'd ever experienced. I can remember, you know, she was there, my grandmother was there, and my brothers were there. I mean, such an extraordinary day. The day that was so moving was the day that I uh, came home mm -hmm. and I showed my grandfather who had a third grade education, my degree. It's the first time I'd ever seen him shed a tear. Wow. And so, you know, you see that and you see that 
the power of education, the power of me having achieved something that he'd never had the opportunity to achieve. That's amazing. I remember that so vividly. It was such a moving moment. And, you know, things like that motivate you to go do more. Yes. Here's, a, did. Uh, here's a man who didn't have that opportunity, just didn't, you know. And I remember he used to tell us the where he worked, worked at Jack Potaski Jewelry Store. Mm -hmm. And he was a janitor there, and he used to go tell his uh, tell the people who for whom he worked. You know, my my grandson goes to Harvard. He goes to Harvard. And he was so proud when it came off of his came out of his mouth. You know, what, that's what this is all about. Yeah. What did he say? What did your grandfather say when you showed him the decree? The he, degree. There, it, there were no words. It was just it was just a tear. He was a proud, he was a yes. proud, proud black man fought his entire life, taught himself to read. Mostly read the Bible, but taught himself to read. And he mm -hmm. sees his grandson graduating from Harvard. You know, yeah. prayers had been answered. Yes, amazing. His sacrifices and everything. Okay, you then enrolled in a four-year JD MBA program at Harvard. You earned at the same time a law degree and a degree in business. Okay, why, why'd you decide to do this at the same time? <laughs> You know, it's actually interesting. I was only going to go to law school. Yeah. And then there was a there is what we call a tutor, which are these people who are kind of there and and bring students along. And there was a brother named Larry Jackson. I remember this vividly. And I hadn't intended on applying to business school at all. I was going to apply to law school because I was going to go be Perry Mason. And and he said, Ray, you know, you can you can have you go to business school and half your half your grade comes from debating. He said something that's a little more close to the street, but half your class, half your grade comes from debating with folks. I said, seriously? Like he said, yeah, man, half the grade. I said, okay, I can probably get down to this, right? So I was going to go to law school, which was three years. And I said, okay, I'll just apply to business school. I applied to one business school. I applied to Harvard Business School and I got in. They called me up and said, you got in Harvard Business School. This is all interesting. I wasn't so excited about it. Yeah. And I just added one year. I went to the joint program. I didn't have any money, so it was all scholarship. So just education was it. And get as much education as you can get for as long as you can get it. Yeah. And that was it. That was the sole motivation. I knew uh -huh. nothing about business, zero. And, and so now you are triple Harvard, undergrad, mm -hmm. law, and mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did <laughs> say, mm -hmm. yeah. Did the, drop the mic. I didn't say drop the mic. I'm just saying the facts are what they are. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Hard work. That was a lot of hard work. I don't, I say that humbly. Okay. I cannot imagine what that workload was like. I mean, it was, you know, was it just ramen noodles? Like just all day long? <laughs> ramen noodles. Come on now. You didn't know ramen noodles. That's new. We didn't have no ramen noodles. <laughs> oh, that's you didn't have the ramen noodles back no, then. We didn't have ramen noodles. No, we had Elsie Burger, you know, <laughs> cheeseburger with some fries, or maybe the tasty restaurant with a Charles River, <laughs> River Porgy, which is a fit, which you don't know what that is, the fish sandwich. And when you really splurge it's all around, you get some tartar sauce and some mustard and some relish and some ketchup, <laughs> and you eat well. That's what I eat. Ain't no ramen noodles. <laughs> but here, here's the thing. Here, here's what I want to know. Did the job offers just start pouring in? Well, first you got to interview. Yeah. You don't get no JD. Just all of a sudden, just show up and let's do this alphabet. Okay. That is that. Maybe that's the 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 misconception that you know you 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 graduate, you got triple Harvard. No. The, the offers are just here. You go. Just sign your name on the dotted line. It wasn't like that. No, it wasn't like that. You have to interview. You got to go interview. Remember, you you this is the, you're playing at the, you're playing a, the, one of the most competitive games at the highest level. Yeah. Yeah. It ain't a popularity contest. Right. The Harvard, this Harvard degrees get you in the conversation. Then you got to yes. perform. That's yes. about performance, right? So, yeah, I interviewed. All right. Uh, okay. You, you went to New York for a job on Wall Street. You know, did you have at that time the total confidence that you could make it? No, Sean, let me explain <laughs> something to you. I interviewed, I didn't, the, it was a business school section mate of mine, yes. David Anderson, Lou Wright Anderson said, Ray, I've seen you in section. I think you'd be pretty good at this investment banking thing. I didn't know anything about investment banking. I interviewed and they said, are you interested? I said, I can get interested. And so I had to go through an interview 
And that's a whole other story. But I had to go through an interview to get the job, to get the summer job. And that in and of itself was, that was a story. So Okay. Tell, but we'd like love to know, what is the story? How did you do in the interview? What did you, did you, yeah, I don't know. How did you prepare? What was so it like? You don't prepare. You just don't, they call you in. So you sit down and, you know, I can remember the first interview and I got through the first interview, Sean, and they said, okay, Ray, we want you to come to a cocktail party at the uh, Rich Carlton in Boston. I'd never been to a Rich Carlton. Rich Carlton in downtown Boston. I get down there and it's supposed to be a cocktail party. And I go into this little small room before I go went into a big room. So I'm there and I said, well, there's a cocktail party. Maybe get a beer, right? I'm not a big drinker. I get a beer. I pop the beer. They said, come on, we're going to go into, you know, into the interviewing room. I get to this room. There must have been 20 to 30 people in the room. And they all left the room except for one person. And he took his chair and he turned his chair. He straddled his chair, turned the back of the chair towards me and said, OK, um, you got five minutes. Shoot your best shot. I said, what do you mean to say? He said, I don't know, but you got about four minutes and 45 seconds. I'm thinking I'm from Dayton. I don't know anything about this. This boy's up in my grill. So I got nothing to lose. So I said, listen, Harvard College, Harvard Law School, and Harvard Bitter School pride themselves in taking the cream of the crop. I pride myself on being the film off the top of the cream. He said, okay. Wow. He said, you got, uh, you know, got half the business school class out there who are uh, interviewing for two summer associate jobs. Why you? And uh, I said, well, in the heat of battle, it is better to have me on your side than to have me against you, because somehow I'll find a way to win. I, I, I don't believe you said that. You said that right? summer chose your jobs. That was, you know, that's a lot of years ago. <laughs> oh my gosh, you actually said that in the interview, and he was like, <laughs> "Okay, listen, I'm from the neighborhood. People gonna come up to you like that. You could come on now, seriously. You know how that work? Ain't going down like that." I didn't know anything about the business in the first place. That man coming at me with that kind of okie doke stuff. No, uh. -uh. You better, be, you better get somebody out here and guard me. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm on my, I'm on my youngest boy. You ain't coming to me like that? Mm -mm. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. So, <laughs> all right. You, um, in 84, you uh, had, you worked at First Boston Investment <laughs> Bank, your investment bank. Uh, Wasser, Wasserton. Wasserstein Perella. Perella. Mm -hmm. Managing director, mergers and acquisition, then to partner. Mm -hmm. Merrill Lynch started managing director, mergers and acquisitions. Morgan Stanley, mm -hmm. a global co head of mergers and acquisitions, and then City in 2005. Global co head of investment banking, global head of corporate and investment bank, chairman of banking, capital markets and advisory, vice chairman of Citigroup. Okay, that is a remarkable trajectory trajectory. Um, let, to tell me what you were able to exhibit uh, in these positions that that accounted for you, you know, what, your career track. Um, you know, what skill sets did you have? What, you know, give us, uh, you know, how did it, uh, how did it happen? How do you get there? How do you stay there? Let me tell you. Yeah. I call it the, the following. Uh, this has been a walk of faith. This is a walk of is and always has been and always will be a walk of faith. So it's prayer. First thing is prayer. Second thing is preparation. You got to be prepared. I know what it's like not to be prepared. That's not a good thing. The next thing is performance. You got to perform. You're in the game. You have to perform. And you know what? It's not a popularity contest. You don't get in the game without performing. You don't stay in the game without performing. And the last thing is when you grow up in the neighborhood, you know, you got to have a little bit of paranoia. You cannot believe the hype. But you know, every day somebody trying to take your lunch money, somebody trying to take you out. So your game's got to be tight. And so it is those, uh, it, uh, it's on those four pillars that I stand and have stood and will continue to stand. Mm -hmm. Right. And when you get there, when you recognize that and you talked about Dayton from the start, that's my foundation. Mm -hmm. It's the foundation of prayer. And with that, I can go on. Mm -hmm. you know, with, with, with you, all things is possible, he told me. And yeah. so I believe that. It's and, were there other, but are there other 
God-given talents that you have? Do you have a, you know, an intuition? Um, is it that, you know, is it, was it advice from someone that said, okay, stay at this place for so long, then make a change here and then go there as opposed to staying with one company the whole time. Give us, uh, give us, give me some feedback on that. You know, it is, um, there was no intuition, so to speak. I got recruited by two guys, Joe Perella and Bruce Wasserstein. Mm -hmm. When they started Wasserstein Perella, they handpicked people out of Wall Street that they wanted to come when they started the firm. And they were they were the best that existed on the planet. And they were kind of the mavericks of their era. And they could pick and choose the best talent, which they did. Mm -hmm. And um, when the when they decided to separate, I decided that there was a time when I left Wasserstein Perella to go to Merrill Lynch. The reason I did that was because I wanted to separate from Joe and Bruce. Mm. And I, then I went back and got the, uh, I went to Morgan Stanley. I got, it was a third time I got an offer from Morgan Stanley and did pretty well there and then got recruited to city. What do you need? There's no intuition there. Remember, you have to break down the doors when yeah. you look at the people who are in these jobs who you could ask, there's only one or two other people on the client facing side of the business. And so we're 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 going, you know, in territory that it was uncharted. Mm -hmm. So you have to go. You got to go. You got to go with the street instincts. And you know, I'm always reminded every step of the way, Sean. I'm reminded what the great Ralph Ellison taught us. We say, play the game, but don't believe in it. Mm. And that helps you refine how you think about opportunity. And each at each firm, every move that I made was a move that gave me a bigger opportunity and a bigger stage in which to perform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What are some of the deals that you put together that you're most proud of? Listen, I'm actually proud of most of them, frankly, mm -hmm. all of them, because I was in, in a field where clients have the opportunity to choose whomever they'd like to advise them on the most important, in many ways, the most important decisions that CEOs and boards are about to make. The fact that I was chosen to lead the team and manage the relationship means they trusted in my advice. Mm -hmm. They trusted in my experience. There are two deals that I can reference here that were that you know help create jobs and help further and help the companies maintain their viability in what is a fast changing world. Mm -hmm. One is a transaction which you all probably know about. There's a company called Time Warner. And I'd been advising Time Warner for quite some time. And when Time Warner decided that it wanted to transition, given everything that's taken place in the world of technology and streaming like this platform, there was time to satisfy the shareholders and advise on selling Time Warner to AT&T for, I think it's $105 billion, mm -hmm. which is the 105 or 108 fifth largest transaction in the history of all transactions. So I was I'm quite proud of that and having the opportunity to have advised Time Warner. And the other is, is there's something called a special acquisition corporation now. It's called a SPAC. And one of the last transactions that I was advised that I was involved in uh, before I left City was a SPAC that was raised by a, a brilliant um, financial uh, person whose name is Bill Ackman. Mm -hmm. And he raised a $4 billion special acquisition co uh, corporation. The reason I was so proud of that is because it is the largest IPO and we were able to get four black and brown firms involved in leadership capacities. Mm -hmm. And so and the economics that they got were more economics than they'd ever gotten before in an IPO. So this set the standard for us being involved in the most important part of the capital raising, raising equity capital. And they were there. And I'm quite proud about being involved in making the introduction between those firms and Bill Ackman and Bill Ackman's interest and support of making sure that they were included. So I'm really proud about that. We need more of that. And so uh, those are two things that I just two things that I that I would point out. Um, w one of the things that we have talked about on this platform um, that so many uh, executives say is so key is building strategic relationships, uh, longstanding relationships. Uh, tell me about how that works in your business and how you have been able to do that. 
You know, it is, it, this is, that's the essence of the advisory business, right? And so CEOs and senior management teams and boards look to those people in whom they have trust. Mm-hmm. And they look at the relationships that they developed over time and they look at how those relationships are formed. One of the longest standing relationships I've had, which I've had for most of the entirety of my career, is with a company where I advised them not to do a transaction because I didn't think it was in their long term best interest. Mm-hmm. which is different to how many of the people whom they had talking to them had advised them. Others say, yeah, go do the deal. And I said, you shouldn't do the deal. Notwithstanding the fact that it would result in large fees to our firm, it wasn't the right transaction for them. Mm-hmm. The result of which is for the past 20 to 30 years, Sean, I've been the lead advisor on practically every transaction they've done anywhere on the planet. That comes out of trust. Mm-hmm. It comes the fact that they know I'm always going to do what's in their best interest. And it's important to be able to develop those relationships, but it's also important to be involved in the community so that you develop peer-to-peer relationships with leaders. You don't want to come as a vendor. You're not selling anything. You're developing those relationships as a peer. And so it's a peer-to-peer relationship. So part of what I've learned over the years is develop those relationships, get involved. Yes, yes. Uh, You said that almost no one on Wall Street looked like you. corporate finance, uh, there are always stories from black executives who are mistaken from for someone other than an executive, okay? Um, so many times uh, somebody thinks that you are in any position other than the one that you are actually in. Have you, do you have those stories? Uh, anybody's- Ooh, Sure, what am I? I could be a lot of things, Sean. And if I, you know, this jacket, if I had on a tie- Yeah. If I don't tie on a big department in a big department store, I'm gonna be one of three things. I'm clear about this. I'm gonna be men's suits, I'm gonna be a uh, restroom, or I'm gonna be security. I will the last thing I'll think is I'm a customer. So I got that. So I, you know, I start directing folk to the wrong direction. I, you know, <laughs> men's suits, you gotta go up seven floors and turn left. Where's the bathroom? You gotta go down the elevator. Nope, the elevator ain't working unless I check. And what about security? Okay, who do you want me to arrest and why? So I get these people and, you know, after a while, it's a joke to me. Yeah, I know security, right? So, and I can walk outside my house also. I get, I'm a six foot, 200 pound black man. I understand what goes down, right? It could be me anytime. I'm not confused about this. Mm-hmm. Not confused. So I think, you know, people get dressed up and do all this stuff. They have no idea what I do, who I am, how many degrees I got. It don't matter. I'm a six foot black man. Just be clear about this. Right, right. Uh, I want to talk about your run for mayor uh, and why you decided to uh, step down from your uh, executive uh, position. Uh, But before you left city, you spearheaded a report on the economic impact of systemic racism. Uh, The report states that not addressing racial gaps between blacks and whites has cost the U.S. economy up to 16 trillion dollars over the past 20 years. Talk to the audience about that. You know, it is, um, I was fortunate to be able to have input. I wrote the forward to that. The economist, a uh, young black woman, Dana Peterson, brilliant, along with the lead economist at City, Catherine Mann, uh, and the head of the entire business there asked me if I wouldn't get involved. And so what it, what it, I, what it examines in detail, and as I know you've gone through this in detail, It examines the systemic racism that exists in the economy, in education, in healthcare, and in the criminal justice system. And it identifies the impact that's had on the US economy. It goes further to say that if we begin to address it today, that's an additional $5 trillion to the US economy, $5 trillion. So the analysis is there, it is irrefutable. And any of those who are interested, they say, well, we can't figure out how much it costs. We can figure out how much it costs mm-hmm. and we know the remedies. But today the system has, the systemic inequities have just been uncovered. What we've talked about in that report have been uncovered by COVID. They've been uncovered by George Floyd, eight minutes and 46 seconds of a cold blooded murder to which I cannot explain to our eight year old Leo because he wants to make certain that it's not gonna happen to us. I just says, Papa, is that going to happen to you? Is that going to happen to Mama? Is that going to happen to, you're going to have to call Lorella, you know? And, and Papa, is that man going to turn blue? Mm-hmm. 
eight minutes and 46 seconds of a cold-blooded murder. So when you see that, you see the impact of systemic racism that permeates our society and the impact it has on our youth. Um, the, the death of George Floyd, was that um, one of the turning points for you? Did you uh, at that moment say, you know, I, you know, I've got to do something about this or, you know, how is my how is my life and the life of my my children going to be impacted? So I need to chart a different course. You know, you look at these circumstances, Sean, you look at where we are today and over the past few years, we've gone backwards. And so I look at the opportunities that young black and brown kids have, and I ask whether or not they're going to have the same opportunities that I had, same opportunities that you had to get to where you are, the same exact opportunities, which is what we ultimately should be about. And yes, I could have stayed where I was, but no, to whom much is given, much is required. And so you got to do what they tell us to look at the lily work, look at the work that you've put in. And so each of us has that dash, don't we? That dash, it's the time we come in and the time we go out, and we have to ask ourselves, what is that dash going to represent? What will they say? What is the legacy? And so I'm quite I'm quite proud of the legacy that we have so far, the legacy of my family, which is the dearest thing to me, my soon-to-be 95-year-old mother, and all those mentees of mine who I've spent so much time with and whom I have such pride at their accomplishments. But you know what? There's so many out there who look like us who don't have these opportunities. And so unless we do something about it, it ain't going to happen. There ain't no plan B, ain't no Calvary. This is up to us. And so I said, if I take what they now call my lived experiences, which is how I grew up, if I take that, John, and I take what I've been able to experience in business through building and leading, and I take all the relationships that I've been able to develop over the years in New York City, we are broke, broken and divided. We need to come together. We need to have somebody who's got those relationships and that skill set, who knows what it's like not to have, to bring us together. And that's why I decided to, that's why I decided to run for mayor. We don't get it done, it ain't gonna happen. It ain't gonna happen. All the false promises, all the things they've promised us have yet to be fulfilled. And you know what? I, I quit my job. I didn't get termed out. I'm not looking for a promotion. It ain't about me. It's about we. And we got to step up now because the system has showed us if we don't step up, ain't nobody going to step up for us. We're in a dangerous crisis now, so we have to come together and do something. Otherwise, we've not seen this scenario. We've not seen this scenario. It's bad. Mm -hmm. I'm getting worse. Uh, you serve on a number of philanthropic boards, a studio museum in Harlem, New York Public Library, De La Salle Academy and New York Presbyterian Hospital, just to name a few. Uh, tell me about those roles and why they are fulfilling to you, uh, because philanthropy is uh, very important to you, which mm -hmm. uh, something, one other thing I admire about you, Ray. You know, the shoulders in which I stand, you know, I grew up with a, with a family that was involved. My grandfather was the Sunday school superintendent and uh, the state Sunday school superintendent, head deacon. My grandmother was the head of the missionary board. My mother's involved in the church. So we have always had examples of leadership, of involvement, of giving back, of being servants. And my involvement in these organizations was a matter of me getting interested and then taking on roles because the boards asked me to take on leadership roles. And so each of them has allowed me to get involved and each of them has allowed me to be supportive in a supporting role, in a leadership role, but in a supporting role. Mm -hmm. Studio Museum in Harlem, there is one of the most brilliant people that we know across the arts and culture and arts education, Thelma Golden. It's an honor to be able to work with Thelma Golden in her leadership of the Studio Museum in Harlem. And oh, by the way, we started off with the idea that we're going to build a new building and people looked at us like we were cross-eyed. We had zero money. And today, and the goal was $175 million. We've raised that goal. She's now at north of $200 plus million. The board has been extraordinary. Mostly black people on that board and some very generous other people. So the Studio Museum will lead us 
and is leading the dialogue in arts and culture globally. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about De La Salle Academy. I've been involved in De La Salle Academy. De La Salle Academy is a school for gifted inner city black and brown people run by Brother Brian Cardi. And I got involved in De La Salle because I wanted to have those kids who look like me, make sure that those institutions were there, that institution was there for them. And there's a school that was the offshoot called the George Jackson Academy for black and brown boys. And so that has been so fundamental. You mentioned the, the, the public library, I think. Well, mm -hmm. the public library is, you know, today the public library is as essential as it's ever been. And the branches especially, because most many of our kids don't have access to Wi-Fi. And so yeah. what we push for at the public library is you can get within 100 feet of the library and access Wi-Fi to do your homework. Mm -hmm. Because the library is providing that service. That's education. And then New York Presbyterian Hospital, we've been involved in the hospital for so long, especially with nurses. We've been fortunate to give a nurse's station in the emergency room, Chris and I. And so we've been dedicated. And, you know, my word says be known by your deeds. And so if you look at the track record, if you look at where we've been involved in arts and education, healthcare, you know, that track record is a track record in which we're going to be pretty proud. That dash is going to reflect that. But there's more to that now. There's more to that now. So there is certainly uh, the track record is is very, very impressive. And what what parting words would you give to our LinkedIn audience? Uh, a lot of people here, uh, I, I love the family on here because, you know, everybody's trying to strive to do better, um, you know, reach their goals, set goals. Like what, you know, what is the one piece of, of advice you would give to people who, uh, you know, are just trying to level up and they might get discouraged, especially because we're dealing, we're in this time that we're in with the pandemic and everything. What, what advice would you give to them? You know, it is. I mean, these times, these times are hard times. These these times are hard times. Uh, but I remember, you know, I grew up on the rough side of the mountain. I remember the words of the great, of the great person who kind of got us through when we had nothing else, Brother James Cleveland. I know James Brown. And I know James Cleveland. Some of y'all may not know James Cleveland, yeah. but James Cleveland used to sing a song. I don't feel no ways tired. He brought me this far, and I don't believe he brought me this far to to leave me. And those of us who are in the faith-based journey recognize that. And those who who maybe not be recognize that there's a talent there. There happens to be a beautiful talent that exists in black and brown skins, which is a talent of beauty, a talent of excellence, a talent of genius. And we should think about not how bad we have it, but just how brilliant we are and how we can make a difference and how each of us has a role to play in this great journey. I celebrate the truth of that from the first day and from every day that I exist. And remember my, my man Omar says the game out here, you either play or be played. Mm. And you bring that A game every single day, the way that you do, Sean, to get to a, a, a show like this, for you and I to be able to have this discussion. What an honor. Hollywood ain't right, no stuff like that, okay? <laughs> this is good. That's right, and I wanna end on, Okay, so I'm, I'm telling my audience, um, I, I want to end on this story. Uh, a few, several years ago, Ray was on a business trip out to LA. And so I called Crystal's wife and I said, hey, does Ray want to go to a Prince party? And she's like, yeah. So I tell Ray, hey, Ray, here's the address. And so I remember that night at the house, at Prince's house, I introduced you guys. And then, you know, you walk off and then Prince said, now, who is that? I said, he's a Wall Street executive. And so, and so it was really funny. What do you remember about that night? Very briefly, Ray. Prince, you got to be kidding me. Live concert? No, I didn't. I pinched myself three or four times. This is like genius. This is genius. I'm saying, you know, uh, I think about those lyrics, right? Your beauty, if I were to strike me down, your beauty, I would see. I think about that when I think about my wife. So I'm just, yo, you now you take them. Now you didn't lit me up on Friday night, okay? <laughs> but that was a fun night. You danced, had a great time. Well, you know, I, I, listen, I'm from Dayton, Ohio, okay? I come by, I know how to move. Don't get this <laughs> twist. Don't get that Wall Street Google stuff you got going on twisted, okay? I <laughs> step back and drilling on them, and you know that music, get, I'm okay with that. I get it loose, okay? Don't get me going Friday night. <laughs> <laughs> it was a fun, fun time. Fun, fun time. My friend Ray McGuire, 
everyone uh i've kept you a little bit longer than i said i was going to keep you uh but thank you so much ray i really appreciate you taking the time uh give a hug to my girl crystal uh in addition to little leo and ella and cole um how about that cole anthony okay cole, cole is lighting them up there's a game on tonight so i'll figure out how he's doing but okay. cole anthony number 50 orlando magic that's right. Ella Anthony, Leo McGuire, we're all in the house, represented by my beautiful wife, Crystal McCurry. Here we go. Thank you, Sean. <laughs>